Well, welcome everybody and thank you for taking the time to be with us on our webinar here today. This webinar is being brought to you by UC Irvine Extension and today we'll be talking about social media analytics uh, and text visualization. But before we get going, just want to let you know how the webinar works. Uh, we do have the audio lines on mute uh, and we really encourage questions. So use the Q&A area or the chat area. And for you guys, it should be up there in the corner of your screen, uh, off, the, off the screen that you can see uh, uh, here. But up uh, there, there are a couple tabs, one for chat and one for Q&A. And we will be monitoring those and, and we will get those questions to our presenter. And please feel free, whatever the questions are, uh, we really, really encourage that. It makes the whole webinar a lot better for everybody. Just by way of introduction, my name is Dave Demas, and I'm the Director of Engineering and IT Programs here and a faculty member in the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering, and you have my contact information there. We also have a, our Program Manager, Jackie Badwa, uh, is with us as well. And the reason we put our name and numbers up there is uh, a lot of people on these webinars are thinking about careers and, and moving on and maybe changing careers. And Jackie and I both have uh, spent a lot of time uh, talking to people in, in this industry. Uh, we've got a, a certificate program, we have courses, we have a lot of things that we do here at the university. But more importantly, we, we can be a resource for you guys to help guide you in careers, whether it's you know how to get that first job or you're unemployed or you can veterans benefits or whatever the issues are, uh, use us. One of the things that the University of California is, uh, is, is wanted to do is certainly do our teaching of undergraduates and graduate students and research, but the one that, um, that, that we do is to make sure the current workforce in the United States has got the skills that employers want. So we go out and look, look for those skills, present these kinds of webinars that help get people uh, those skills more, the, more updated. Uh, we create courses. So we kind of know the area. We talk to a lot of different people, and we'd be glad to help you out. Uh, so please feel free to contact us if there's anything at all we can do. Well, we are very fortunate today to have Nick Kadoshnikov with us. Uh, Nick has been a, an incredible asset for us here at the university. Uh, he's currently a principal data scientist at IBM's chief analytic office, as it says there on the screen. Uh, and he's also, he teaches for us, he's taught for, as it says there, the University of Chicago in their Masters of Science in uh, Analytics program. Uh, so he's had a tremendous amount of experience, not only teaching, but certainly that teaching came from uh, a number of years. You can see there were more than 15 years of experience in a wide range of applications, including, you know, the, the big data, the data mining, the predictive modeling. Uh, and you can see up there the other, other things that he's doing. He'll show you a little bit more on his next slide, but uh, Nick has really uh, had a tremendous amount of experience and a lot of, actually, a lot of success in this industry in a variety of, of fun and interesting things, and he's been a tremendous asset for us here at the university. Nick, we are uh, really uh, glad to have you here. Dave, thank you so much. Um, okay, and I'm so, yep, I can see I'm presenter now. Um, so let me make sure my slides are visible. Yes. Outstanding. So I'll do a quick introduction. I know it's sometimes helpful to kind of put a face to a voice. Might not be the best mugshot in the world, but at least um, we get something. So as Dave pointed out, I've done quite a few different projects. Um, I call myself more of a Swiss army knife approach to data science. So I really don't focus on a particular area. I just do what's needed. Um, and I think it gave me lots of different flavors from sales analytics to resource allocation to customer short modeling. And what I really found out in my professional career is you get the most benefit by combining multiple techniques and multiple deliverables in one package. That's where you get the most business impact. Uh, so. Today is perhaps one of my most favorite topics is the social media analytics and text visualization. It really opened the aperture to help us understand the voices of the customers in a very different manner. And I wanted to walk you through some basics, maybe share some interesting ideas, and hopefully I'd be able to showcase a couple of interesting projects we've done in this area at IBM. So, 
why social media? Um, well, obviously, it's so fueled by the rapid growth. The social approach is truly a new norm in a consumer space. And I'll give you a couple of figures. They probably shouldn't be coming as a huge surprise to you, but still. So half of the world's population is online, which is over 3 billion people. And almost all of those Internet users are also mobile. So what they do is they consistently use more social media tools to shop, spend, and share insights. And uh, when we talk about social, it's really big picture social. If I purchase something on Amazon.com and I post the product review, I'm being social, I'm sharing my experience, right? So it's, it's really not limited just to the Facebooks of the world. But if we move toward the kind of the, the three big names in a social space, or, or maybe four big names with Google Plus there as well. So Facebook has over 1.2 billion monthly active users. And if you think about that number is big, think about almost a billion of them are mobile and 757 million of those are daily users. And the numbers might be a little old, maybe six months old, but still, you know, the pictures, the numbers are very, very significant. So the premier B2B kind of business social site, LinkedIn, it's used in 200 countries. Pretty much every single country in the world, with a very few exceptions, has a LinkedIn users. And today they have grown to over 250 million of them. And, and uh, um, the other premier source for social business or social uh, media information that we analyze is, is, of course, a Twitter. 284 million active users. They're sending 500 million tweets every single day. And 80% of those users are active on mobile. Well, so what does it mean to us? If you think about how we're spending our days, so this chart is for Americans. An average American spends about 16 minutes of their online time on social networks. So if you think about other areas like entertainment, shopping, business email, all of them seem to be significantly smaller than the social impact. Um, is it just a U.S. phenomena? Well, the answer is not really. Uh, there are some deviations, um, and, and you can see the picture comparing the time per hour spent on social media networks between U.S., Australia, and United Kingdom. You can see the numbers, is, you know, there is a little bit of a deviation, right? So U.S. average is 16 minutes, Australia 14, U.K. 13, but still it's about 27% of personal time spent on the Internet spend on a social media networks, which includes forums and blogs and traditional social media, which is a very significant, almost a third of our time. Um, and then you can see that the registered users are growing so rapidly. So this phenomenon is fairly new. Uh, the Facebook is barely 10 years old and it already has a billion users. The Twitter is, rap is, is um, uh, growing so rapidly and of course Google Plus is trying to catch up as well. So basically, huge number of users, rapid growth, and very, very recent at the same time. So if you think about from a little bit different angle, so uh, this picture uh, so from McKinsey, they represent the social technology adoption rate. So what does it mean? It means that we want to understand how long for a given technology it took to get the 50 million users. So the first one was radio. It took 38 years to gain 50 million users. The TV did it much faster. It took them only 13 years. Then iPod took four. And then we're kind of growing into the internet age. With internet, it still took three years to get 50, 50, 50 first million users. With the Facebook, it was just one. For the Twitter, it took even less than that with nine months. So what does it mean? It means that the, the technology is becoming so rapidly growing and, and so disruptive. So I would be shocked if the next big thing does not get the first 50 million users in just six months. So, so the, the rate of growth of those technologies is truly explosive and, and truly changes how business is running today. The other uh, kind of myth I wanted to dispel is that, well, it's all about um, the kind of the, the high school kids who have nothing better to do. Well, guess what? That's not really true. If you think about who is growing fastest at the social segment, it's not just about the high school kids. 
So for the Twitter, it's the 55 to 64 age bracket. For Google Plus and Facebook, it's a similar 45 to 54 age. So it's really about people who have more to contribute than just kind of maybe share their high school experience. It really is the truly valuable insight which we in, as data scientists can mine and make valuable business recommendations and conclusions on top of those. Um, I think I have a bit of hard time uh, moving to the next slide. Okay, wait, I could get yeah, back to the first one there, Nick. Yeah, so I, I put it to no 10, and I think it's kind of stuck after that, after 9. Okay. Uh, it, uh, Nick, if you, if you need to... Uh, Bring up your uh, PowerPoint slides on your screen uh, separately, and then under communicate, under uh, share, say share my screen. Let me do that. Yes, for some reason it's just one. Yes, sometimes we have a little trouble with WebEx here. Yep. So is it visible now, Dave? Yes. Yes. Okay, sorry, I apologize about that. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how we can reasonably visualize the data. So obviously we got in the first section that tremendous amount of data, tremendous amount of social insights growing rapidly, but what can we do to effectively display this data? So what I've done in the preparation for this webinar, I downloaded the UCI Irvine extension brochure for data science program. And it's not a giant one, it's just a couple of pages PDF document. I had to clean it up a bit. And basically I took the Wordle, uh, some people call it Word Cloud, some people call it Wordle, it's pretty much the same thing. It's the visualization that um, displays two dimensions. It's the word and a frequency, and the more frequent words will get the larger fonts. So what do I get out of this visualization? Well, I get a couple of things, right? I see. Uh, frequent mentions, right? And this one is, by the way, case sensitive. So you can see the data with a small d is mentioned a lot more frequently than data with a big d. Uh, but then what else do I get? I get things like course and units and business, analytics and learn. So maybe I'll get, I don't know, top 10, top 15, top maybe 20 words, and then it becomes a bit too small for me to read. It's almost like an eye chart. So I got kind of big picture, what is it all about? And I can give you one page um, on this brochure, and it, you'll probably have a good understanding of what, it all, what it's all talking about. So it's all about data analytics and, and help you learn analytics and, and help you learn some of the tools like MapReduce technologies and systems. So a good, good insights, um, probably if I were to analyze a lot more data, it means that the words are going to become infinitely smaller, and I also don't get as much relationship between those words as well. Um, I can try a few more visualizations, uh, so it's basically, I, I'm just trying a, a bit different uh, take on Wordle. Um, I get, you know, a few more, kind of few additional words highlighted, but still, I mean, my, my message really doesn't change that drastically. I still see it's about data and course and business and providing some kind of big data techniques and tools like Python. So there are a few other ways for us to visualize the uh, text data. Uh, this one is called the word tree. So basically it's the same brochure, uh, same set of text, but what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to narrow down on a specific word. So the biggest one for us obviously was data. So this one helps us understand what is linking to data. So we see the data science was number one. We see the data mining, data warehouse, data management. So once again, I can probably decipher, I don't know, top 10, maybe type 15, if I kind of blow up this chart a bit more, uh, combinations, kind of what's important about the data. And you can see on top, I'm getting um, roughly 107 hits. So it's still, um, I mean, it, it, it is a significant number of frequencies, right? I, I just don't, I can't figure out maybe beyond the top five or 10, you know, beyond my data science and data sets and data scientists and data mining maybe data warehouse and management, kind of what else is important. So maybe I'll try kind of a couple of different ones. 
So if I take a bit more detailed view, I would dive in into data science, I get a bit more clues, right? It's, it's a lot more sparse. So from data science, I see it's linked to data certificate program, and then data certificate program helps me accelerate my career, and it helps corporation um, who dramatically increase the investment in digital enterprise. So, so I get a lot more leads by doing this, but I have to kind of do it one keyword at a time, which is still pretty manual and, and will require a significant effort. So what if I try some other words? I try analytics. It's not as frequently mentioned. I got um, 17 hits, and I can see what analytics is about. So we'll see analytics and machine learning, lifecycle analytical tools, analytical programs. Um, there are some kind of shorter sentence analytics to begin the journey, analytics to a business and its goals. So, it, so I can kind of decipher and, and narrow down as a kind of slicing the pie by going through the funnel to understand specific words and what they mean to us. Um, and, and maybe I'll try one more word. Um, that same brochure, the word is now course. Uh, I got about 26 hits. And um, it basically tells me that the course will help students who are interested in pursuing the data science and predictive analytics. It's also about course that provides an overview of business intelligence and data warehousing. So it's, it's a great tool for me, the word tree, if I want to analyze a specific set of keywords or have a limited um, uh, set of kind of information like a brochure or a program, maybe a specific website. But certainly that would make it quite challenging if I want to analyze 100,000 Twitter messages. So the next technique uh, on data science uh, that we use in, um, uh, in data visualization for text is called the phrase net. Uh, the phrase net helps us visualize specific linkages between the words. So basically here I'm getting kind of the top phrases um, roughly 40 some of them out of a program brochure. And you can see, um, for example, that predictive analytics is kind of both art and science, you know, the interesting um, kind of phenomena that, that the tool has been able to capture, and I'm a firm believer in it. And it really kind of helps you link the kind of most important words. We're linking on the word and, by the way, right? So it's classes and methods, it's industries, the industries that leads to job and uh, statistical information that we can use um, to understand the behavior. So it really gives us lots of insights about the data. Um, so I can kind of analyze the text and get the key concepts out of it. Another example of a phrase net would be if I'm linking on space instead of linking on an end word. So basically now I get a bit different picture, right? So the, still the, the similar themes, right? Predictive analytics, and data mining and data visualization. So I have some, some about units. So I can extract kind of some of the golden nuggets out of this information and text and really get a good feeling um, what is it all about. But once again, I can only process certain amount of information, which is usually um, somewhat limited if I think about mining social media. So what am I getting out of it? Um, I gave you one more example. Uh, this one, I, I took a book, 200 some pages, analytics across the enterprise. Um, and I've tried doing a similar word cloud. So I got, you know, a good view of what it's all about, analytics and data and business analytics. But really, I don't get any view into kind of detailed coverage. So it's very, very high level. So the bottom line is, Text mining and text visualization is not any different from a traditional data mining techniques. I can't take 100 million records of banking transactions and I can't um, effectively visualize them in one spreadsheet. I have to do analytics first, I have to get my insights out, and then only I can visualize kind of this distilled information, which is data to insights. Very similar concept applies to the text and social media have to distill the data first and then visualize those insights. Hey, so hey Nick, a quick question on, on the, uh, uh, the, the, the tool that you're using again. Uh, uh, is it, is one of the questions that came in is, is it free or uh, what kind of cost is that word cloud? Uh, so all of this uh, free web-based tools. Um, um, I use the tool in uh, 
my class, the, cool, the, the basic of the tool is called um, uh, Many Eyes. It's a web-based tool for IBM, uh, pretty much put uh, for everyone um, to use for free. Um, the only limitation of a free version is whatever you visualize is kind of available for everyone. Uh, so you wouldn't put your kind of company confidential data, but the visualizations that I shared with you can be can be done for free. And that's the the spelling, guys. Is it's just as he said, it's many m a n y space eyes, right? I think it's just one word, many eyes. You can Google it and okay. get to the page. And then uh, Tableau provides limited uh, visualizations um, for text. And the other tool is if you just uh, Google the word cloud or Wordle. Uh, I think it's been created by the same gentleman who initially wrote the many eyes functionality. So uh, basically, whatever I've shown you so far, um, I did not have to use um, uh, any commercial software to do that. Well, because we didn't have to pay for it. Great. Thanks, Nick. You're very welcome. So let's talk about a bit different aspects. So let's talk about how can we understand customer behavior with social media analytics. So why is it all about? So we got that, you know, there are tons of data. It's growing rapidly. We also got some ideas that we can use some tooling to help us distill some of the insights from the data. So what can we do with this social media analytics? Well, really what it does, it helps us understand a lot what customers have to say. And with this insights, we can understand their needs, we can understand their desires, and understand as companies or even as a nonprofit institutions, how can we target and make sure that our services are catered to them. So first of all, social media is perhaps the largest possible and the most cost-effective focus group. So if you think about the focus groups 20 years ago, how do you make the 20 million business decision? You get 50 people in the room, you pay them, uh, I don't know, $100 for, to compensate them for a couple of hours of their time, and you're trying to make this 50 million or $100 million decision based on the opinion of those 20 or 50 or 100 people in the room. So very biased, and it also depends on kind of who can you recruit. So while social media listening is not totally unbiased, uh, it gives me a couple of advantages. First, I'm moving from 20 people to about 20 million people with a few clicks. Second, um, it's generally very cost effective, right? So I don't have to compensate people for their time, I just have to establish proper um, uh, data feeds and make sure that I can get access to relevant data, which is usually a lot cheaper and then I have to basically be trained on how to use this information with the right tools and techniques. So it's very, very, very uh, cost effective. And the third piece, of course, it's a time. So if I think about traditional marketing campaigns, uh, if you think about uh, the time it takes you to get the first focus group to talk about whether your TV ad was effective, usually on average companies burn about two thirds of their marketing budget by the time you can get the first focus group together. It means that by the time you got the insights, uh, your information is pretty much irrelevant. So the big difference with SMA or social media is that you can get the insights literally minutes after the campaign hits uh, the TV or radio or internet. Uh, and you can accumulate the first responses literally 24 hours. So very fast, very effective. So the second piece uh, still about timing. It's um, we can monitor events in what we call a near real time or over time. So what near real time means is, well, it, it's not like in a nanoseconds after someone posted the message, but reasonably after 15 seconds um, or kind of if I want to digest this information a bit better, maybe a couple of hours, but I have information that's available to me literally hours after the event. And uh, not only it, it's fast, it also allows me to monitor the trends, which I can do with the focus groups effectively. So I can say uh, two days after the campaign, my response rate was X, and then three days it went up 20%. So that all brings me to the rapidness, right? I can respond rapidly and make uh, kind of midway course corrections. Uh, 
So what's the benefit? Well, the benefit is if I can basically, I, if I don't have to wait for five months to understand that my product is not going to be very successful, if I can do it in three days, I certainly will save myself a lot of money not producing the inventory that I'll have to kind of clear and out and sell at the markdown price. Uh, so that's, in my opinion, is, is an enormous benefit on its own. So if I think about kind of recent deployments that we've done at IBM and see where um, the social media analytics provided a huge benefit, it really covered a broad areas of the industry. It was a, in a product development. Think about how many ideas about what customers want in your product, feature functions, functionality. They can be helping you co-develop this product. You can mine those insights to understand uh, what customers want, what customers don't want, what they want to pay for, what, what they want in the next iteration of the product. And most of this information, they're willing to volunteer for free. There are lots of enthusiasts about specific brands or products. Second piece, it's a competitive positioning and pricing. Well, the beauty of social media, if I'm listening to someone on Twitter or on a product blog, on a product reviews, I'm not really limited to my specific product or my specific brand. I can get the information that equally covers my product and competitive offerings, and I can understand how am I positioned against the competition, whether it's a product, whether it's a pricing, whether it's a marketing effort, so I'm getting a lot more holistic pictures. The third use case is if I'm thinking just in time manufacturing. So for example, I have customers on the East Coast that are very interested in a, a white Ford Explorer and they didn't like the black one at all. If I go through traditional channels, it's gonna take me months by the time I'm ship, I build the cars, I ship those cars, um, and they hit the dealer lots and they spent, I don't know, four months there sitting on a lot, no one buys. I, I spent so much time before I got them into those insights. It's pretty incredible. It, with SMA, I can shorten or compress the cycle rather rapidly to make sure that I'm only shipping the product, basically the white Ford Explorers to the dealer lot because customers on the East Coast want to buy those cars. Another element that we had a lot of success was early quality warnings. Um, and once again, if I go to um, automotive industry for a second, it, it takes months to understand if the product is failing. So basically, let's say customers are facing issue, let's say with a fuel pump. And, and, and by the time the dealers will accumulate all of this information, how many fuel pumps are failing, and then can aggregate it to the district, to the country, then goes to the manufacturer, that we, we, you know, the automotive company ends up with a huge product recall. If I can compress the cycle because I'm listening, I see some feedback from dealers, but I'm also listening to the social media, I'm getting a lot more rapid response and I can do kind of midway course correction and replace the failing fuel pumps from manufacturers before I build too many cars. And the other one, uh, IBM, we had a quite a, few government agencies that were interested in leveraging social media analytics to kind of better understand citizens' concerns. It's not about kind of 20 people who decided to come to a meeting or five newspapers that decided to publish a story which is kind of very filtered. It's really listening to what are the concerns um, of the residents of a particular city or a county um, and, and have a lot more holistic view based on thousands of comments, not just three or five of them. So the next piece is, well, obviously, yes, it's, it's powerful, it can do a lot of things, um, and it kind of leads us to how, how, how it's done. And, and the approach is called natural language processing. So what is NLP or natural language processing? It's basically 80% of the world's information is unstructured. And while not of all of this unstructured information is text, some of it is videos and images, which today's computers are kind of struggling a bit more with, still a significant volume of this information is text. It's a pretty much a free form text which we can mine. And um, the social media analytics itself is not very different from a text mining or nature language processing. It just uses kind of different source data, but the techniques are still the same. 
So with um, NLP or natural language processing, basically we extract patterns from text of unstructured collection of documents. And it can be books, it can be articles, it can be social media, it can be all of them combined. Um, and, and you see some of the examples. So, so this one is like a big dashboard which monitors the social space. Um, of course, the value comes where you're kind of listening information in new real time. It helps you understand what are the top trends, what's trending, what's important. Uh, and it gives you a, a big picture about kind of this information in new real time. You can see like at a city level or maybe at the police department level, what are the top social media messages that might be um, trending or will you know, what, what's the kind of unfolding or developing story. Um, so Nick, Nick, what real, do we, real quick, uh, I was asking was the, the, the requirements on the hardware, how powerful is the hardware that's needed to get to close to real time um, social analytics? So real time requirements, um, they, they're very, very significant, I would say. Uh, if you want to do something like this, which I think it's a social dashboard or social business engagement center, you know, this is a very complex hardware setup because it has to monitor so many different feeds in a near real time and do a near real time processing of this information, which is all set up in advance. That's, that's pretty significant. So to put the dashboard like this, uh, it requires a significant IT architecture and, and a significant expertise in place. If I'm just looking to analyze uh, 5,000 tweets or even 50,000 tweets, and, and I don't have to do it in real time, I've just collected this data and I don't understand what it's all about, um, that really does not require such a significant infrastructure. I can easily do it on my laptop. So it really requires, it, it's all about the timing, um, the volumes of information, and um, basically whether you require real time or you can uh, be happy with the batch processing. And a related question is, is, is how, how much uh, data typically do you need to do, uh, you know, the response analysis, the campaign response analysis? Can you give them just some idea of the amount of data you need to be successful at that? Uh, the, you know, the traditional consultant response would be it depends. Um, it really depends <laughs> yeah, of on, on, kind of, on the number of messages you're trying to track, on the number of responses. I can tell you that if you think about kind of traditional uh, focus groups, they roughly what 10 to 20 people. Uh, I would be shocked if I can't get at least 100 times better with the social media. And of course, the challenge is a lot of them are going to be pretty much garbage, right? You'll have to reject lots of the messages, but still, if I think about only clean responses which I can use, I easily, you know, 100 times improvement you know, to 20 people in a um, kind of fo in, in a panel on a focus group is very, very attainable in most of the cases. So, so uh, thousands is usually where we start, and uh, uh, rarely it, it kind of falls kind of beyond a few thousand people at least, or a few thousand messages. And if I think and about those laptop. volumes, is sorry, it's all on a, you know, it's all basically on a laptop or traditional in a computer environment. You don't have to have a big data infrastructure to do that. And Jamal was also asking, can, can you use HCI hardware, the human computer interaction stuff? I, sorry, I'm not familiar with that technology. Okay, all right. Jamal, if you want to ask that question a little differently, or uh, but, but uh, we'd be happy to try to re respond. But okay, Nick, go ahead, sorry. So in, in SMA, we really care about two separate things, um, and, and we call them buzz and sentiment. So what buzz is, it's really a measure of frequency. It's how much customers are talking about a specific product or brand. So let's say if I'm um, working on a Ford Explorer, my buzz would be I will be measuring on a daily basis how many mentions of Ford Explorer do I see on a daily basis, hourly basis, and I would track the frequency. And um, the second piece is if I'm tracking the share of buzz 
I can set up, let's say, Ford Explorer and maybe top two competitors, which might be what, like Jeep, Jeep Grand Cherokee and let's say Honda Pilot, or maybe Toyota Highlander as well. So I would be checking not only how many messages am I getting for my product. So let's say if I'm getting 50 and then I started getting 60, it might be an improvement, but maybe I've noticed that I've jumped to 60 and Jeep Grand Cherokee jumped all the way to 300. So that, that certainly is you know, not as good for me. Mm, so kind of those two elements, the frequency of kind of specific product or specific brand that people are mentioning, and also kind of comparing whether, the, whether I'm getting a fair share of buzz as it relates to my biggest competitors or other you know, products or um, companies in that specific area. And the second piece is, of course, if I see the jump, let's say my product was getting uh, 100 uh, mentions and now I'm getting 500 mentions, is it a good thing or a bad thing? Well, I have to do sentiment analysis to understand whether it's good or bad, because if my jump from 100 to 500 was caused by people saying your product is an absolute garbage, that certainly is not the buzz you want to generate. So what we do is we do the so-called classification of the sentiment. Um, and there are kind of three major types. Um, it's called a positive, negative, or neutral. So positive is when people saying, well, you know, great product, uh, basically positive um, comments or positive feelings about it. Negative means people are unhappy about the products or unhappy about the brand. Or neutral means uh, maybe some, something just informational where the sentiment cannot be um, extracted. And of course, if I think about um, uh, what's required uh, from kind of human intervention uh, versus what kind of traditional software packages are allowing us to do, is a lot of the sentiment extraction um, is automated. So packages have lots of languages preloaded, and I can do the sentiment extraction based on the dictionaries and the dictionaries are um, catered to a specific functionality. So I might have a dictionary for, let's say, customer feelings or product reviews or a, um, advertisements, but it's still, like with any data mining application, it's what we call half art, half science, because dictionaries will only kind of give you the foundation. You still have to know what you're doing and, and apply a significant amount of uh, kind of personal touch and uh, significant amount of your time to make sure that the sentiment that it captures is accurately reflecting your product, because some of the words might be um, uh, might not be very relevant. And, and I can give you an example. So um, let, let's say uh, I purchased a new sports car, and, and I said that um, acceleration was absolutely crazy. Um, and the product might develop or might interpret crazy as a bad sentiment versus uh, my, uh, in reality, I said that acceleration on my Chevy Corvette was crazy, meaning it's super fast. I, I absolutely are thrilled with it. So basically, that's where the human touch and human intervention has to take, take um, and, and come to fruition. The second uh, piece on the sentiment is basically how does it change? So let's say if I had a sentiment and I'm tracking it was mostly positive, and then my new product got announced, or my new marketing campaign went out, I want to see how it impact the sentiment and the buzz. And those two always measure kind of side by side because you want to see whether you have, you're seeing more people mentioning your product and when you want to also understand whether those mentions are positive or negative as well because kind of you control for both. You always kind of keep those two dimensions um, in mind. Um, I'll give you one of the examples. Um, a little bit of an eye chart, um, but I really don't expect you to, to kind of to focus on individual uh, measures. Uh, so basically, this one is we, we're monitoring for um, uh, but potential uh, disruptions in the supply chain. Um, and basically, what we're looking for is if everything, like this is a traditional anomaly detection, right? If everything is smooth or everything is progressing, um, with a steady pace, whether it's a high or low, we truly don't care about. But when we see the significant spike, we want to go back and understand the source of the spike so we can see what was the uh, potential disruption to our supply chain. And you can see basically when we detect a spike, we go back, we mine a specific set of um, social media posts 
which caused the spike, and we would get um, kind of the key message, or we call it the concepts, basic snippets of the words, uh, or the words, and then kind of trace them back to a specific event. So you can see this one, what highlights five events, and you can see that kind of the color coding, once again, might be a little bit difficult to read, but, but the idea is each line represents a specific word. So basically the red one is for audit, the green one is for fraud, the yellow for corruption, and when we see the spike, so this spike in red is referring to the audit keywords that we're tracking, and basically this one is talking about the big four bar from auditing U.S. companies over blocking SSC probes. So basically the idea is I want to detect the spikes, I want to detect the deviations, and I want to understand which keywords caused it. So is it a real time? Well, probably not very much so. It means that as I track things over time on a daily, on a weekly basis, if I take in a snapshot and if I see the big spike, I can go back, evaluate what the spike was, and even with that, I can be quite significantly faster versus if I wait to really understand when my um, supply chain hit a real roadblock. Hey, quick, so uh, next, gonna, one, one sure. question, Nick. I want to just go back to Jamal's question. Uh, I, I had uh, transcribed it incorrectly. He was talking about hyper-converged hardware. Uh, is that something that can be effective uh, uh, in, in this application? Um, so, so they have to apologize. I'm not an IT person, really, um, uh, to the degree that, that it goes. I think it's a pretty technical question. I really don't know. That's the kind of the best, honest, fair answer. Okay, I know, that's all right. Um, yeah, so, so I mean, I, I'm happy to, uh, if, if you want to reach out or send me a quick email, I'm happy to convert you or connect uh, uh, to some of our kind of IT architects and more technical people, but it really pushes the boundaries of kind of IT processes or IT hardware that I know. No worries, no worries. Um, so if we go to, um, uh, to the next thing, so what else can we do? Well, once we got the messages, what can we do? One of the very popular things, and, and this is what actually we're doing a lot today um, since IBM got locked in, in, in signing the um, uh, exclusive partnership with Twitter, we do both personality profilings and micro-segmentation. So what does it mean? So the personality profiling means if I look at the comments and I can understand who they're coming from, and, and there are three major groups of people we're worried about. One is we call users, Second is called recommenders, and third is the prospective user. So we usually can do the text mining and based on the comments of people, and it really is where we have to link those posts. I can't just look at one, let's say, tweet or one blog post. It really requires me to be able to connect those back to the user. I can understand what their personality profiling. So let's say if someone already driving Ford Explorer, it's a user. If someone is a huge advocate and keeps posting about this is a phenomenal product, you should go and test drive it with your dealer, it might be a recommender. And if I'm just looking on a forum because I'm trying to decide between Ford Explorer and, uh, let's say, Honda Pilot, I'm going to be a prospective user. And we can do those personality profilings uh, based on combination of, uh, of basically the text messages of the post um, and uh, bringing in a little bit of a demographic information about the actual posters. And then what do we do with those profilings? Well, we do the segmentation. And on a social media scale, it's more of a micro-segmentation. So we can really form users or form the uh, participants of social media into those micro-segments and, and see if someone uh, posts a lot of positive message, uh, let's say, about Diet Coke versus someone is very concerned about the health effects of Diet Coke. Um, basically, what type of segments are those people? Are are those uh, I don't know mothers who care about their kids? Are they older people who can concern about and the health implications? Are those um, young kids who absolutely um, enjoy drinking Diet Coke? So you really can can go back and try to understand who those users are. And once you form those micro segments, you can mine a lot more about their preferences, maybe between um, multiple products if you just start comparing them together. So it's really very effective. It's uh, it's really when you blend in and the different and, and kind of the distinction between your traditional data mining with things like um, cluster analysis and uh, 
segmentation can be merged and morphed um, with um, insights from social media. That's where we see most of the power. Um, so maybe the next question someone w would ask is, well, okay, that's great. You have a gazillion of different social media platforms. And this chart is um, a couple of years old, but, but you can still see how distinct and how many different tools we've got. So the Facebook and Google, you know, obviously very popular. You still see tons of comments on YouTube and Twitter. And then you would go into um, countries outside of the United States, um, like China and Eastern Europe, where totally different platforms are really uh, popular. So what, what's going to happen is how can I possibly or reasonably mine all of this information together? It probably is totally futile effort. Well, the good answer is uh, it's actually not. Um, so when uh, when we do the SMA, uh, we really don't go back to individual sources. We use the services of what we call the data aggregators. And um, this is more of a convenient sample, these five I know of. And um, I can tell you that um, most of the cases we use GNIP. GNIP, I think, has been acquired by Twitter, um, and uh, GNIP is a fairly holistic source for us. So they pretty much have almost all of the Twitter messages that's ever been sent out. They also mine things like message boards and product reviews. They mine blogs and forums and online news articles and video comments. Um, and, and you can see the other ones. Um, I'm not trying to advocate for a specific one. I just have more experience with GNIP. But the other ones, like Board Reader, I think it does pretty much most of them except for Twitter and then Trendiction pretty much uh, has a similar coverage as well. So the beauty is I don't have to go and request access to 50 individual sites and product comments and reviews. I can use a single source to get most of this information in one single place and then effectively kind of select the specific types of messages or sources that I need for my particular application. So that comes very handy and saves an incredible amount of time as well. Um, so I, I spoke a lot about where the power is, and the power is it's not just mining SMA, it really is overlaying SMA with additional data. And this additional data can be market research, it can be product sales, it can be traffic or weather patterns, and that's where the power is, it really shines. So if I go beyond traditional text mining and sentiment analysis, um, it's, it really gives me kind of a lot of information I can digest and process. Um, and I can do things like structure customer feedback or even to measure the sentiment. But the power comes once I start augmenting it with my other sources. And my other sources can be what we call a legacy sources. So legacy sources might be what your product data, your sales information, your employee compensation data, your maybe call center performance data, traditional marketing research. So if I use this, can I combine those two sources of insights, my kind of legacy, what I can keep proprietary within my company or within my institution, and then I overlay it with the SMA, that becomes incredibly effective. Uh, so let's say if I monitor the buzz and I can correlate the buzz with my weekly sales trends, that becomes very powerful. And we've done some of the work for one of the very large retailer trying to kind of link the data between the sales information um, and uh, social media insights. And it comes very predictive in a traditional um, kind of predictive analytic mo analytical models. So there's lots of power. And the third piece is it's most effective not just when it's overlaid with other sources of insights, whether these are external or internal, it's also very effective when used over time. So it's not enough to say, well, I checked it once and I had 150,000 mentions of my product. It's about how does it change with time. So it, and, and you can monitor this buzz and share of buzz uh, basically over time to see what's happening in the marketplace, what's happening with your competition, and once again, it's not limited to just my products. I'm mining the kind of free information, and I can listen into whatever competitors I want to listen to. So it gives me a lot more of a holistic picture about my product and my nearest competitors as well. 
so if I think about, yes, it's very complex, but the beauty is for, for user perspective, what we're delivering to the users, it does not have to be. So this is one of the example. Um, the product is called just a social analytics iPad app. So the analytics and kind of heavy lifting happens behind the scenes, but what we're pushing to the end users is very simple. It's like a tiny dashboard they can access on their iPad or uh, their laptop device. And the beauty is you don't have to kind of send the complex uh, text mining algorithms back to your user. You process the results um, and you send the distilled information that they can immediately act upon. So um, it really masks the complexity and makes it a lot more actionable for the decision makers. So with that, we have a couple of minutes left. I wanted to show you some of the case studies um, and um, basically help you um, understand how this data is used. So this one was done a couple of years ago um, for the Super Bowl event. Um, we analyzed roughly one billion social media posts to determine the reaction to movie trailers. They were aired during the Super Bowls and Oscars. And as you can imagine, advertisement during the Super Bowl is not cheap at all. So basically the client, and I can't tell you who the client was, but basically it's between the Avengers and the Hunger Games. Um, they, they were interested in seeing whether the investment of millions of dollars during this peak prime time on a TV did actually pay off. And there were uh, five major questions they wanted to answer. Basically, how many people are talking about the film? And they wanted to understand it's, uh, did they actually show the intent to go and buy the movie uh, to the theater and, and actually see the, the film? And the obvious next question was, well, did the trailers that uh, they aired, did they actually make any impact on this decision? So basically it's one thing to say someone kind of wants to see the movie and another to say, well, after watching, uh, after seeing the Super Bowl ad aired, 35% more people, let's say, showed, showed the intent to, to go and watch the movie. So the, the, the next block is about the demographics. Uh, and we talked about micro-segmentations a bit. So they wanted to understand, are they hitting the right demographics? So basically for those people who show the intent in going and buying those tickets, who are they? Uh, what's their profile? Are they influentials? Are they movie goers? Are they comic book fans? Who are those folks? The third big element is about the reaction. So what did they say? Did they like the movie trailer? What specific plots have the kind of the best and the worst reaction and why they felt about it this way. Because obviously they want to try to iterate and make sure that the next version of the marketing advertisement is improved based on the feedback they're getting from customers. And finally, the competitive piece. And, and we spoke a lot about, well, the data is not just limited to me. So if I have a competitive product that's being advertised during the same time, during the same very kind of famous event, I want to understand how did my trailer compare? So if I monitor between those two, which one of them generated more buzz, which one of them was more positive? If it was mine, fantastic. If it wasn't mine, kind of how come? What, kind of what did they do better than I did so I can learn from my own mistakes and hopefully improve my campaign next time um, I have an opportunity to promote my trailer? Um, so the quick key questions were around three dimensions. One is buzz, basically frequencies. What's the level of conversations about kind of the feature before and after? Um, how does this com campaign compare to others? And it can be competitive or can be other 20 campaigns I aired, let's say in the last couple of years. I want to see whether I'm getting better or not at those. Um, and uh, the third is what's the share of my movie-related chatter, right? So if I say I want to look at every single message that mentions any movies or films, what's my share? Is it 1% or 5%? Because just looking at the spikes is not enough. I want to see whether I'm getting an increased share of those spikes as well. So the second block is about the segmentation, basically. Who are those customers? Am I hitting the right people with a message? 
and a third is about the sentiment. Did they like it? Did they advocate other people go and buy the tickets based on a trailer? Did the people show intent to go and purchase those movie tickets and see the film? And am I reaching that audience? And if I'm not reaching my audience, who should be my actual audience that I should be reaching, right? How do I adjust? And you can see a couple of, um, so I, I'm not gonna talk a lot about the actual data that we use, but uh, the key decisions I think that's were important, right? So number one is, is my campaign effective? Number two is, did I do a good job? Or should I actually adjust my messaging? Number three is, should I tailor my campaign around the specific demographics? So did I reach the right people? And finally, do I need to adjust my marketing spend or tactics? Did my decision to air during this very expensive um, sporting events actually paid off? I would, I, would I have been better taking my money elsewhere? I think we have one, we have a few minutes left, so I'll do one more. So this is a tracker of investor sentiment. Uh, so for color perspective, um, green is a positive sentiment, yellow is a neutral sentiment, and red is the negative sentiment, and the, those kind of blue artifacts is something that we could not trace. Maybe it's a combination of languages that we were very successful in um, interpreting. So the bottom line is you want to see how those colors are changing. And if you see, so let's just take a look at the first um, um, chart, April through June. So what you can see is yellow and green remain fairly steady, and then we see a huge jump in red, and it's a red sentiment from investors spiked up, and we want to go and understand the root causes, right? So basically, uh, the keywords in this component was tax liabilities, selling a business unit, and then the shares have plummeted 7.3%, right? So basically, you can instantly see how the sentiment progresses over time, and you can see, um, you can kind of capture those either positive or negative messages and determine the causes of spikes. So let's take a look at, uh, at, the, at another chart about the snippet. So basically, uh, July from September, we can see that um, we had a couple of spikes. Um, fortunately, the, the big one was green. And if I kind of trace this green one back to my messages, it's what about a joint venture with a Nippon Steel. It was about positive analyst reactions. We had a little bit of a red spike, maybe not as significant as um, in um, April, June timeframe but still we detected one, and this one was related to the net loss of uh, $1 billion. Um, and the other one, if we kind of move toward October, December timeframe, um, we see a little bit of a spike in negative once again in here. So it was a uh, forecast of a loss um, and um, certain businesses not performing as they want. However, we saw the, kind of the spike in here in green, which was the share price um, increased reflection. So we're running out of time, um, only have a minute left. Um, I wanted to hopefully deliver the message that social media analytics is a great tool. Uh, it's uh, maybe just to summarize. So, so it's a fantastic capabilities. Um, it um, allows us to open up the aperture and understand clients much better. And where it really drives tremendous amount of effectiveness is where when you combine it with traditional predictive modeling capabilities, so you can improve the understanding of your clients, improving understanding of how the business reacts to specific events that are taken in the marketplace. And finally, that you are not limited to just your product. You can actually understand how you relate to competition and um, how uh, your particular messages or products perform in the marketplace relative to the closest competitors. So Dave, any final comments, closing remarks? No, Nick, that was, that was excellent. And a couple questions. Um, uh, we're we're going to um, just make sure everybody understands that we did record this video um, and so or this webinar, so it's, you'll get a link back to the URL. And, and we do have a couple courses, a little advertisement here at the end, but we do have a couple courses that Nick teaches in these areas in, in data science and data exploration. Uh, we have an entire certificate program 
there is uh, no requirement that you sign up for a whole certificate. These are short little courses that we've found that uh, from talking to industry, like, like people like Nick, they tell us that they're trying to find people with these skills and they just can't find them because a lot of undergraduates aren't exposed to this stuff. So we pulled together, which is one of our missions is to again, keep the workforce uh, highly skilled. We go out and try to find areas where there's a gap between what's coming out of college and what the employers need, and this is certainly one of them. Uh, we've had a large turnout here today, as we always do with these kind of topics, uh, and we have some courses. So if you are at all interested, there's something that uh, we can help you move along, or you want to take a course from Nick, uh, this is our little sequence of courses. Uh, there's some a couple of required classes and some electives, and again, there are electives all over the map. Uh, some of, most of them are focused on data science, and we have a couple other programs that are related, like predictive analytics, uh, and then some of the other stuff in the hardware side as well, and then some of the database stuff that all relates to getting doing a good job of this. So give us a call if there's anything we can do to help to move you along. Here's a list of the other courses in the program uh, that are electives, and these are all online, by the way. Uh, but with that, I, there, there's a bunch of sources for funding, too, if you happen to be a veteran or anything. So any questions like, um, you know, how, how to pay for this, any of those sort of things, Give us a call. call. We are, we are well informed with uh, both Veterans, Workforce Investment Act, a lot of people, uh, a lot of sources of um, uh, people getting paid, getting these things paid for. They're not terribly expensive. Typical classes are anywhere from $600 to $700 each, so they're not terribly, terribly expensive, but they are sometimes a nice next step for people. And they're real courses with real instructors. They're not massively online open courses. Their, their regular courses with University of California credit. Well, with that, I just want to say thank you so much, Nick. That was excellent, very interesting as always, and thank you for everything that you continue to do for our program to keep it current and, and fun for, for everyone. And thank you to all of you guys for hanging out uh, for uh, this uh, hour. A lot of you, I know it was your lunch hour, so I appreciate you uh, doing that. And with that, I just want to say have a great afternoon, everyone. Thanks again, Nick. Thanks, Dave. I appreciate the opportunity.